Matthew Ferguson was the production designer behind the Netflix limited series Hollywood. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Matthew. And to kick things off, I'd love if you could just talk about your experience and your familiarity with old Hollywood, especially in the 1940s before you signed on to the project. So, I mean, it started actually when I was in third grade, I saw a film called The Snake Pit. Um, mm -hmm. film made, made in the 1940s mm -hmm. with Olivia Haviland. And I remember as a child seeing one particular shot where the camera cranes up and we're looking down on these, you know, mentally ill people. And then suddenly it turns into a snake pit. And from that point on, I didn't fully understand it, but I knew I had to figure it out. So I started devouring anything I could on Hollywood, on filmmaking, on international cinema, and um, cut to when Ryan offered me this job, I was thrilled. I was so thrilled to be doing a show about an industry and a craft that I love. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned about the state that I love that movie. I love all the Olivia de Havilland movies from the 40s. So do I. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that scene? Oh, yes, of course. How could you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we're not. So talking it was about that. from that point on, you know, and I just sort of devouring kind of the the art of filmmaking and um, starting with directors, then the studio system and how, you know, at that time during the golden age, every motion picture, everything you needed was within the walls of the studio. You know, the contract players, the hair and makeup department, the commissary, the offices, the stages. So um, it was great to recreate that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you have worked on some Ryan Murphy productions in the past as a set decorator, but this was yes. your first experience as a production designer on one of his shows. And also, from what I understand, your first TV series in general as a production designer. Yeah. So can you go into a little more detail of how that role came to be for you in the pre-production process? I worked with Ryan over the years. I decorated his first film, Running With Scissors, which was also a period piece. And um, I was working on Ratchet, which is another show for Netflix. I, I believe it launches in September with uh, production designer Judy Becker, who I've worked with over the years. And um, when Hollywood came up, Ryan offered me the job to um, production design it, and I was thrilled and um, kind of honored that he trusted me to, to, to do the job. So I took it and ran with it. And my background is in set deck um but over the you know as you work you start to learn other departments and you work with production designers obviously decorator and production designer work very closely at times the decorator would work with the art director so i had the background but not you know i needed help with you know the construction end of it and mark taylor fabulous art director who was our art director really brought so much to the table and um it was just a big collaboration i had two senior set designers jan engel and carol bentley fabulous and um i just i like to collaborate and um we had a really good time it was a team effort mm -hmm. And there's just so many fantastic set pieces in the show. I mean, starting with the gas station. Uh, how did you end up just finding the right look for that? Well, when I met with Ryan initially in July, it was sort of broad strokes. We didn't have a script, or I didn't have any scripts. Broad strokes of what the story would be. We knew it would sort of follow loosely based on Scotty Bowers and his gas station. And it would also follow a group of filmmakers making a film within the studio system. So going back to Scotty Bowers, his gas station, I believe, was on Hollywood Boulevard. And it was an old Richfield um, gas station, which is a great kind of streamlined, modern gas station, white, with the casement windows and the big entrance bay that it protrudes out from the front. So we scoured, had two very good location managers, Matt Prisk and Adam Robinson, searching high and low all over LA County to find the right, you know, gas station that we could take over and um, turn into our set. And so we, we found one on Glendale Boulevard 
and it was originally a Richfield gas station, but it had been painted blue. It was no longer a gas station. It had been modified over the years and kind of deconstructed. So we made a deal with them and Ryan liked it. Ryan wanted to have the scope and it only had one entrance space. So we ended up building another sort of big overhang. So we had two sets of gas pumps where cars could pull in and out. And uh, we built casement garage doors. We repainted it. My painter, Dan Tanger, and I went over so many shades of white. You know, you think white is white, but you start doing variations and you lay them together and suddenly what you initially thought was white now looks gray. So we worked on the color palette and, and, um, and doing that. So, yeah. 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 And Melissa, Melissa Lick, the decorator, found um, a company in Atlanta that we um, commissioned to build us period gas pumps. And so we had those made, shipped out to us, and then we painted them in our color palette. And then Hillary Amit, our graphic designer, did the graphic, the golden tip. Mm -hmm. the golden tip actually was a gas station was a brand of gas. Mm -hmm. So that color, the yellow and the white, that and the blue was sort of taken from those early you know, gas stations. Wow. Well, we also see the Ace Studios quite a bit, which is the fictitious uh, movie studio that kind of replicates one of the big five studios of the time period. Um, was there anything specific you based those interiors on? Well, like you said, the five major studios that dominated the film industry during the golden age, um, we kind of looked around to see different studios today that we could potentially use as our exterior and Paramount, which is where we shot the gates, um, still really parts of the studio still really retain that old Hollywood look. So that was sort of our exterior. And from that point on, we built off of that. We kind of modeled it a little bit after RKO and MGM on the interiors. Um, but we took our color palettes from the exterior of Paramount and then took deeper saturations of those tones for the interior. Um, the commissary was modeled after Paramount commissary with the portraits of the movie stars all around and the big light fixture looking down on everyone as they eat lunch. Um, and actually, my set decorator, Melissa, one day she was, you know, it was a tall task to find 100 period chairs matching. It's not, and I know, as a former decorator, as a decorator, former decorator. <laughs> showed me this picture of this chair that had been painted over the years, and I looked at it, I was like, you know what? This is the exact chair that was at the Warner Brother Commissary. And I had pictures of, you know, Betty Davis and Errol Flynn sitting in these chairs um, mm. on my wall. So we took those chairs, stripped them, repainted them in our color palette and used them. So it was great to kind of have that historical context in our set as we were filming a story about the golden age of Hollywood. We also, she also found Jack Warner's original desk when he was oh, head wow. of Yeah. So that was Ace's, then Avis's desk um, uh, in the office. Huh. And we modeled, we modeled um, Mark and I looked at a bunch of different pictures, Art Deco offices, and we, we worked over sort of what we thought would be a nice look for the office. And we found a really great picture of Jerry Mayer's office, who was Louis B. Mayer's brother, and he was head of production. So we, and had a great ceiling, great windows. So we took that and kind of built off of that. That's, this is all very fascinating. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was fun, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, can you talk about the design for the movie, Meg, kind of the movie within the TV show, just the behind yeah. the scenes work there and with the big H for the Hollywood sign? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Hollywood sign, you know, we did a bunch of research. I had a very good researcher, Caitlin. And a lot of people don't know that the Hollywood sign was Hollywood land, and it was built to promote a housing development. 
and it was only really intended to last one or two years. I think it was built in 1923, and it was illuminated, and it said Hollywood Land. And uh, it's funny that something that was built to advertise the housing development has now lasted eight to nine decades and represents kind of a symbol of our industry. But um, Mark and I really, really Mark, spent so much time trying to scale it um, to fit on our soundstage, because I think to the perms was 35 feet. And so we wanted it as big to give the scope and the scale of it as possible. But, you know, I think we built ours at 30 feet and it was getting close, you know, Camille's like, the rafters were right there. So um, we worked at really trying to scale it out and make sure that the proportions were correct. And um, I kept on saying, you know, can we make it a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, chunkier? He's like, well, if we go too large on the uprights of the H, it's gonna start to look like a 70s, you know, font. So anyway, that, that, was, that was a good undertaking to, to do. And then creating creating the sort of the making of the movie. Well, we had the, you know, we brought in all of the period equipment and we built the flats and the set pieces and then sort of addressed all of the issues, the 21st issues that we had on our soundstage, hide those, build period looking flats so that we could come out of our set to then show the world of making the movie. Um, and so that was fun. And it kind of took people back to, oh, we're making a movie. We're in the 40s and we're making a movie. Um, I remember talking with Janet Mock a lot about a film that I love, Black Narcissus, and sort of also other films like Suspicion. There's a driving sequence with Joan Fontaine and Cary Grant, and it's rear projection. And it's sort of those sequences kind of went in and out of the studio. There was kind of this artifice of the world making on a soundstage, and then every now and then they would take you outside. So we did a little bit of that in the driving sequence. I don't know if it fully made it in the final cut, but um, it was fun. Hmm. Well, speaking of fun, uh, the finale, we see a recreation of the Academy Awards from 1948. Um, how did that come together? The, it sort of broke up. Sorry, you were talking about the recreation of, of the Academy Awards. Yeah, sorry, yeah. from, from yeah. the 40. Yeah. That's okay. So, so um, we, as when episode 107 came out and we, leading up to it, we knew that the film was gonna be a success and that it would all win Academy Awards and we would end the series at the Academy Awards. And so, Again, back to research, looking at pictures of what the award ceremony looked like, what the set piece looked like, where it was held. And the 20th Annual Academy Awards were held at the Shrine Auditorium. And we wanted to shoot there, but SAG, the SAG Awards, were happening. And uh, we, we had to work around them for the exterior. And it was tough because we had very limited time to prep. They were deconstructing their scaffolding and we were coming in with our 1948 cars and limousines and setting that up. So you sort of saw modern technology of an awards ceremony going out the door and then here we came with 1940s. Um, and then for the interior, we used the um, Orpheum Theater, which is beautiful. They're both beautiful um, theaters, but the Orpheum, the scale of it, I mean, do I dare say, I think it was maybe worked in our favor um, and so we, again, with the Orpheum, we had trouble because we couldn't scout it because it had been booked. So Mark and I had to get the stage plans sent to us. And so from those plans, we started to try to scale out what the set piece, how big it would be and how it would fit. And so we would look at old pictures of Loretta Young or Celeste Holm receiving their awards. And we'd kind of look at their shoulder and say, okay, I think it's six feet. And then it's probably to the we called it the cupcake, six feet to the cupcake, and then we have our riser, and then, so it was kind of like, I don't know, Inspector Clouseau, trying to scale it out, so it, it worked, and um, I think it did. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, well, just having gone through the experience of Hollywood, such a feels like such a big undertaking, like every single episode. Is there anything that you feel like you'll take specifically from this experience just as you move forward in your career? Oh, wow. Ugh. The love of the craft and the collaboration of everyone. I mean, true artisans and people that are dedicated to, I know you've heard this before, but to people that are really dedicated to their work. And, you know, Steve Howard, construction coordinator, the graphics, paint, we all work so hard. And, um, and I think everyone really cared about the project. And so it helped lift the spirits and keep us moving because, you know, it was tough at times. So it's been a joy and I've, I've loved the whole process. Hmm. And looking forward into the future a little bit, you, as you mentioned, did uh, some set decoration on an upcoming Ryan Murphy show, Ratchet, which did. is uh, an original sort of origin story for Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, yeah. Anything you could tease about that show because I'm very oh, intrigued. <laughs> God, a lot. Yeah. Um, I've worked with Judy Becker, the designer, from time to time over the years, and I love, I really respect her and love working with her. And um, I don't want to say it's going to be gorgeous, but I think it's going to be gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, I think visually it'll be a very fun and interesting show. I think we built huge sets. Um, it also is in the 1940s um, and it kind of flashes back. We have a whole sequence, the Philippine, uh, the war, and uh, we jump back into the, you know, sort of starting with how she became who she ultimately was when we all got to know the character Nurse Ratchet from the book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So it kind of starts off the, the early seeds of her character. And um, uh, I, think, I think people will like it. It was, a, it was a big undertaking. Yeah, I'm very intrigued. Yes. All right. Well, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com to start making your Emmy predictions. Matthew, thank you so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.